Good evening, mathematicians and lay math enthusiasts, if that's a term. Uh, I am so excited about this video. I have been waiting to put this video out for oh, about a year and a half. At least the information in it uh, had to go through a, a long process in writing the paper, which is entitled A Direct Proof of the Riemann Hypothesis with co-authors Greg Bolk and Dennis P. Allen. Um, but this is the... This is the uh, information I've been dying to get out because none of it really is in the paper, only a little bit at the very end. But this is how I made the discovery that I presented to my co-authors, which led to this paper. And this, I think, is the most interesting. Um, and for various reasons, we took all of it out. And, uh, and I do think that's the right decision. But I'd love to discuss it here. So let's get into it. Um, if you watch the other um, two videos, you found how where to find the preprint of this paper at researchgate.net. I did put a link in the uh, description below uh, for this video, and I went back and put it in the other two videos as well. Or you can look it up on Google. Okay, um, as you know from the last two videos, I am a big fan of dark humor, especially in uh, times like these today. Uh, if you need a good laugh, we want to just kind of walk away. This paper was written back in the early 90s, so it'll bring back maybe some memories for those of you who oh, were older at that time, or you know, blah, younger at that time. Everyone was younger at the time, <laughs> unless you were older at that time. Uh, no, um, so those of you my age and older who remember the, the early 90s and the world of just coming out with pagers and cell phones, uh, you might get a kick out of this. Yeah, give it a try. Uh, it does have a couple good reviews. Grady Harp, he's a top 50 reviewer at Amazon. He wrote that Jeff Cook pounces onto the literary scene with a fascinating first novel that is one of the more interesting concepts in storytelling to grace the bookshelves in some time. So this is my only not fiction novel, but uh, um, I'm a big fan of literary fiction. Uh, also got a good, really good review from Daniel Jolly. He gave me five stars. He wrote Jeff Cook's first novel really stands out from the crowd in terms of both originality and excellent insightful writing. I am working on another book. I've got about one chapter left. This is nonfiction. It's a, um, a book on physics, uh, maybe a little bit, maybe natural philosophy would be the better way to describe it. Uh, it's a study on the all of the findings of light throughout history. So uh, got a little Einstein, um, a little string theory, um, Faraday, Maxwell, and, and it's not saying that any of those uh, had it nailed down um, and you'll see when, when it comes out. I've got about one, one more chapter to write. Okay, let's get into what I think is going to be the most exciting of these videos, at least for me. Now, it's going to be overwhelming. If you get through this, if you can get through this, you're gonna, the, the paper is a breeze. The paper is a breeze anyway. Um, and uh, so with this one, um, there's some areas, I mean, it goes deep. Obviously, I've been working on the Riemann hypothesis for about 17 years. There's obviously a lot I turned up, and, and a lot of that doesn't necessarily apply directly to the proof. But let's just start getting into it and show you where we're going. I did have an anal analogy running in the last two videos uh, comparing uh, prospecting for golds for prospecting for uh, certain solutions, namely the primes and the zeros, which uh, um, we saw in the last video, Riemann related uh, the roots of the Riemann zeta function to the prime numbers. And uh, um, we're going to continue this further. So if, if Euler was the prospector and he went and he kind of, uh, you know, he poured out his sieve, all right? He, he got us the, some gold nuggets. He found the mine. I would say then Riemann is the one that uh, took dynamite to the mountain and threw all the, the gold ore and, and nuggets all over the place. This is the refinement of the ore, okay? And you'll see why I call that analogy as, I, I take that analogy as we go forward. All right, how to prove the Riemann hypothesis this is what I brought up in the last video. All right, so there's probably many ways to do it, but this is the way um, I got to it and succeeded, I believe, uh, very much with the help of my co-authors. But this is what I discovered. All right, we're going to step back. I'm going to go way back to the uh, um, uh, to uh, Riemann's xi function, and 
he defined it over t and demanded that the real part of s equals one half and uh, um we did kind of go over this and um let me just see something really quick uh, do, do, do. all right and uh he said t can be real complex any anything quaternion anything you want he didn't say that but he it, it can be any value any type of number but his uh um the hypothesis, the Riemann hypothesis, is that uh, t is real for all of the zeros of xi of t. Okay, so we're going to kind of take this and use some property of it, and we're going to apply it in a different way. All right, but first, let's kind of follow the path back. We're going way back before he ever got to his final result of the prime counting function. Okay, we're going to define it over all s. We're going to ignore the fact that uh, um, he demanded that we set the real part equal to one half. All right, we're gonna solve back for zeta. And there you see in the numerator, pi to the power of s over two, which I mentioned in the first video. And, and this is exactly why, and you're gonna see further, exactly why you get all of those um, positive real values uh, of pi to the power of s in the numerator. Um, so the values uh, of, zeta function. So let's keep moving because we got a lot to cover. All right, we're going to set the, this equal to the able plana form of the zeta function. Now, as I mentioned before, mathematicians have uh, exited the xi function stage left. Well, we're going to do that to the zeta function instead and see where it takes us, if anywhere. Okay, so they're equal and we are going to uh, Eh, you no, know, I like the integral, but we're going to give that third term a name because it's a little clunky. And I just want to get out of the way, treat it, give it, let it be a function in its own right. All right, we're going to call it gamma of s for its very striking uh, value at s equals one, which is gamma of my, uh, gamma minus one half. All right, well, gamma is the Euler Mascheroni constant, which you can get by integrating e to the power of minus t times the natural logarithm of t. All right, good. Now, let's just do some prospecting really quick. We're going to kind of got to go look at the different or here. In the left column, I have some integer arguments for s. Okay, I'm going to start minus 3. Just kind of looking at the basic flow of things here. The second column, we have zeta of s. And it looks like, well, it's you get these nice rational uh, values out for the negative and, um, and 0. Uh, integer arguments, and we see that the negative even ar arguments are zero. We only have uh, minus two on here, but as we keep going, we would see. And we get a big old infinity at one, and we get all the even positive integer arguments. We get this pi to the power of s in the, in the uh, numerator. So it's times some rational um, number. And for the odds, we don't know a whole lot. Now, let's take a look over at Xi. All right, what do we see? If, you're not gonna see it necessarily here on this page, but you can trust me or look into it yourself. It does share all of the trivial and the non-trivial zeros, okay? And more importantly, and more interesting to me, is that it has all of these pi's to some power in the numerator for the negatives and drops out to pi to the power of zero at the uh, s equals zero, and then it starts putting them in the denominator for all positive um, uh, arguments. Uh, so the that the relationship between the zeta function uh, and xi function is simply pi to some power times some rational um, number. Okay, and uh, so good. All right, it's just an observation. Um, Gamma of s, that was the uh, um, integral from the able plana form of the zeta function. And we see that uh, um, it's just a difference. Of course, we expect it to be. It's just a difference of the, the zeta function. And except with the exception of uh, s equals 1, which you get that nice little gamma. He's our single exception where it's not um, a difference of the zeta function. And, uh, um, and at uh, gamma of s is the only zero. That I, or gamma s equals zero is the only zero I found. Um, you can go hammer it with it. It's not uh, up to much importance for me, um, but it's the only one I could find. It definitely doesn't share any of the trivial or non-trivial zeros. And so um, couldn't find any zeros in there except for s equals zero. All right, so 
does this tell us anything? Not really. Does it lead us to the Riemann hypothesis? Not really. But it does kind of illustrate a problem of why it may be difficult. All right, so we have this for the Xi column, we have a purely multiplicative factor of the Seda function. And for the gamma, we have a, a difference. We want, instead of either of those two, something between the two. We want a new function that's going to be a a rational factor of the zeta function. And we have a couple other, we, we see we don't have the resources here. We don't have the resources to move forward. We need a new resource, so that's gonna be a new function, and it has to fulfill, um, it has to fulfill a lot of restrictions. And, all right, so we're not gonna create one, okay? So we don't really create mathematics, but we do begin with the begin, with, with the end in mind. So I, we have to know what we're looking for to have a desired result, and then we can go looking for it, and when it arises, we say, that's it. That's, that's how you go prospecting for gold. You, you gotta know what it looks like uh, before you go looking for it, right? And so that's what this approach is, is we're going to begin with the end in mind. We're gonna look at the, what is the solution we want? Well, if we had the perfect ideal uh, function, that might be some algebraic factor of um, uh, the Riemann zeta function, and it had a couple other neat little um, requirements, then it makes proving the Riemann hypothesis fairly easy, as you will see. All right, so the alternate form of, of the zeta function is gonna involve this um, function, this new function in, uh, in, in one of the terms or uh, some factor, as we're going to see. So what do we want from this alternate form of the zeta function? Well, we want it to be consist of just three terms. Why? Well, because there are only two types of zeros for a plus b plus c equals zero. There's only two types. Now, the first one is where one of the terms already equals zero and the other two terms negate each other. So in this case, we have b equals zero and then a equals minus c. This has a geometric representation of a line. Now, if you take that line and I'm looking at it and going, that's a really simple solution. And all the solutions would lie somewhere on that line. Hmm, remind you anything? What if we were to rotate it and translate it over to the critical line and this type one solution contained all of the critical zeros? What if we could isolate the, two, so the zeros into two different groups, all right? We want two different groups. Why two different groups? Well, the Riemann zeta function, or the Riemann hypothesis suggests that there are only two types of zeros for the Riemann zeta function. There's the critical zeros and the trivial zeros. Critical going straight and up on a, straight up and down on the, on the um, critical line, and the trivial going vertically or, or horizontally to the left, right? So we need a function, well, it, ideally, it'd be great to have a function that had only two types of zeros. We could say there are this type of zeros and this type of zeros, and all of the zeros fit into this, a line, and the other fit into the next type, which is where none of the terms are equal to zero, but two terms negate the third. This has a geometric representation of a plane. Now count the number of points with me, please. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six points, six sides. It is a hexagon, right? Not too unlike the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Count them with me. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, they're grouped in this form. So there, yes, yeah, so well, we discussed that uh, all of the non trivial zeros off the critical line are going to be at the vertices of rectangles that are uh, symmetric across the critical line and symmetric across the real line. And they're going to be internally tangent into the circle, which is right there centered on the real point one half. And we also mentioned in the other videos that these zeros are reflections of each other through that point. So if we draw a line from this one over to here, they're going to go right through the point one half, and this one here is going to go right through this point here. Okay, but we're also going to have critical zeros above and below these four. Okay, so it's six points. Whether or not they're all related, you know, you might only get a solution, a planar solution, where you get this one and this one, or this one and this one. But that's okay, because if we get any one of these, we get four for the price of, of uh, one. And now, whether or not, at this point, we don't know if 
the critical zeros are going to be if we can get the critical zeros from the, these four vertices or if we can get these four vertices from the critical zeros we don't know that yet except that in the ideal perfect uh, expression of the zeta function we're going to have all the critical zeros on a line okay so we might double up and have some in the planar solution as well all right let's go before we get into anything else all right now wouldn't it be nice to be able to rotate this planar solution a plus b plus c equals zero to the, the complex plane uh, lined up on the critical line that would be nice we can do it all right now um hold on one second Ooh. okay all right so <clears throat> all right how are we going to do it all right you have to have a little background in uh, tangent half angle substitution all right now this presentation I, I, don't know, I made a mistake i should have put them before i did this all right but we're going to do this and then i'm going to have the um the uh the description of the tangent half angle substitution below it okay so i'm going to go through a lot of this because it's very quick and this is in the paper at the very first part of the proof this is what we do um in the paper i'm not describing why we're doing this i will show some of it though as we go here okay first begin with Riemann's functional equation now remember these are five different functions all multiplicative factors of each other okay read the other um if you're not familiar with it go back to the first and second videos and check it out all right and if as i discuss, discussed by analogy this is ore gold ore and we don't see any gold in it but we have to refine it in order to bring out the gold all right the gold are the primes and zeros or one or the other because they both connect to each other all right by Riemann's final result in his paper on the number of primes less than a given magnitude let's begin breaking away or i should say we're going to perform a little chemical reaction yeah it's a better analogy okay let's do it multiply both sides by s minus one to the power of three watch the left hand side as we're going i could reduce the right hand side but we're not going to do that at this point because we're going to do something else with it all right subtract both sides by one multiply by i add minus two times the imaginary part of s to both sides multiply both sides by sine of argument of s this is where we're going to kind of bring up some of the uh, tangent half angle substitution here all uh, right we, when doing this we get the absolute value of s the denominator and imaginary part of uh, the numerator not a big deal as we keep refining you're going to get rid of all of that and leave behind just the gold now we got a big old rock here we're going to add two times the imaginary part of s times in parentheses two times the imaginary part of s plus i times cosine of argument of s both sides okay and we're going to divide by sine of argument of s times the complex conjugate of s and that reduces the absolute value and the denominator and the imaginary part all right this is going somewhere you're going to see in about two seconds last step divide both sides by two times s minus one and give that right hand side a name this is our new function with all of the properties you don't see it yet but you will soon all right solve for the zeta function expand and there it is this representation or form of the zeta function is going to tell us everything about the zeros of the zeta function now we do have a little bit of a problem here um, with the uh, s equals zero okay so when s equals zero it is not going to equal the zeta function and not a big deal we have a workaround um, to get to a value for every single uh, argument is going to be equal to the zeta function it's, at this point there's only one argument that doesn't equal the zeta function but we're going to clean up the uh, um clean up this here a little bit i like the i there and complex conjugates so because i times complex conjugate of s squared is equal to minus complex conjugate of s squared we can just kind of call them the same thing but we have the squared in the in the uh, um, third term here we're going to give that a name because everyone's going to ask what is is and i don't want anyone to ask that so we're simply going to call it omega of s and that means it up a little bit we just got to remember that it's simply 
I times a complex conjugate of S. Very simple. Just to get it out of the way, clean up a little bit. All right. Now, as you notice in each of these terms, we have something really interesting going on. You may not see it at first, but we talked about the analytic continuation of the geometric series in, I think it was the first video. And here we have some other geometric series as an analytic continuation of geometric series as well. They each can be described as a geometric series uh, when the absolute value of S is less than one. Okay, so how are they connected? Well, first let's give them some names to show what we're doing and we're gonna come back and we're gonna see how they're connected. All right, because it is kind of interesting. All right, we're giving names. What do you think? A, B, and C, because we're looking for the, the form of zeta function where uh, A plus B plus C equals zero rotated a bit, which these coefficients will be doing. And this function, upsilon, will fill the rest. Now line it right up to the critical line. All right. Now, let's talk about upsilon. I know a lot about upsilon now. And, and this was... Uh, I, I went into every corner of this function as best I could, okay? There's, I still don't have uh, an Euler product for it, but uh, um, I, I can do, I can express it as a functional equation, uh, analytic continuation, or the Abel Plana form, uh, infinite series for when the real part of S equals greater than one. I can do a lot with Upsilon. We're gonna, um, I'm gonna simplify some of this to get just the Abel Plana um, continuation of it we're, so we could put any argument s in and we're going to give value for upsilon okay rather than that big large uh remember that quality back I'll, let me go show you again how big it was getting and so you don't need to know a lot about upsilon for the proof you don't need to know anything about it actually except um its relationship to the zeta function but you remember that everything to the right of that equation i mean that reduces it's just you see where the functional equation is going to come out but um you know, it's, that's ridiculous. We're not going to work with that. So we're going to do something else. All right, here we go. All right, let's get back to my slide. All right, so first we're going to start um, by getting rid of this little problem of S equaling zero, and then it's no longer equal to the zeta function. So we, like we absorbed all of the irrational properties into upsilon, oops, uh, irrational properties of the functional equation, Riemann's functional equation, we're going to do the same thing with this little guy, one last little bugger to get in there, and we're just going to simply call him upsilon 2 of s just for the time being. Okay, so we don't need to worry about him going to zero. All right, interestingly enough, if we do that, um, there is a cancellation in there. So let's go ahead now. Let's show where we're going. We're going to now think of the infinite series. Now, I'm not going to put it on the screen because it'll take up the entire screen with infinite series. Okay, so you mathematicians, you are going to be able to envision this. Uh, and lay mathematicians, you will thank me for not bringing this all up here. All right, but this is what we do. Um, since the zeta function can be thought of as an infinite series when the real part, you know, it converges for the real part of s greater than 1. And the geometric series, which, you know, not hard to look up, or you can just go to Wolfram Alpha and type this in, and it'll tell you what the, the infinite series is for it in that region. But the region where it converges is where the absolute value of s is less than 1. So all we need to do to make them equal uh, in terms of infinite series, we're going we're gonna to make this give upsilon of s an infinite series uh, so that we can apply to the Abel Plana formula. All right, so like I said, I'm not going to show all the infinite series, but to do that, we're going to use the alternating zeta function, which also has its infinite series. And this converges whenever the real part of s is greater than zero. So that gets us now has some equality when dividing that by 1 minus 2 to the power of 1 minus s, which you might recognize as a slight variation of the Euler product, um, uh, the function governing it anyway. Um, we then get the equality in the critical step. All right, and so we can have we can then express uh, rearrange the infinite series. So we're take all imagine these is, is infinite series now. Everything in here is an infinite series with the exception of the multiplicative factor, you know, of two and uh, i times complex conjugate of s squared. But those are just multiples. We're going to solve for upsilon two of s, and we're going to apply it to the Abel Plana formula. Okay, so we take all the series, we apply it for the Abel Plana formula, and this is what we get. So now we have. Um, for any argument s, we get a value output for upsilon 2 of s. And since it is simply a multiplicative factor, we can actually go ahead and uh, um, 
do the same thing with upsilon, which is the, the function used in the paper. Upsilon 2 of s is not used in the paper. It's not, not at all necessary for the proof. Just showing a little background, like I said, this is the area I've been wanting to share because this is where I think um, all, all of the beauty leads up to the proof. Okay, so you see, we just kind of then, you know, build this little relationship here, and then we can get the analytic continuation of upsilon of s. So, good. And again, we cannot, you know, have zero, s cannot be zero. You see, still, upsilon of s cannot be zero, upsilon 2 of s can all right, as it, it, there's, yeah, okay, I'm, not, I'm sorry, it's unscripted. All right, good, and it's getting late, but I'm having fun. Okay, now, observe. All right, back to this. Mm -hmm. What do we got? So, how are they related? I'll show you how these uh, geometric series are related to each other. And this is going to bring out um, our gold refiner, I guess you could say. All right, they're all connected by this, what you could call a regular expression, all right? So if we could think of this function as a finite state machine, and finite meaning there's only three terms, um, and we can apply this to each one of these. And this is how we apply it. Uh, not terribly important to see, but this is, um, we're just gonna expand it out so you can see. Um, you have, for every n, you're going to get, uh, you know, this little sequence here to the right. And if you take the first one and integrate it, you get the first term, right? And we're gonna integrate the second one, and we get the second term, and we integrate the next one, and we get to the third. Now, why is that important? Because it says that they are all uh, derivatives of C. We see, which is this term over here. All right, neat. Electrical engineers, physicists, step in when you see it. This is in the form of a driven harmonic oscillator, okay, at an infinitesimal t. So we can say that the zeta function can be thought of as a driven harmonic oscillator at an infinitesimal t. It is a thermodynamic system. Now, this is really neat. Check this out. Well, it gets really kind of, eh, it's pretty intense. You, you do fine. All right, here we go. Let's just kind of take a little side note into um, the electrical engineering physics, okay? All right, all this was taken out of the paper. We went, I and my co-authors went back and forth. Greg um, and Dennis both are very big fans of, of physics and electrical engineering, but, um, Danny, he, he's more, he, he understands number theory. He, he taught it at the university and he studied it. And uh, Greg, you know, studied uh, electrical engineering and in these aspects. So we're a bit torn, like, do we include this? I mean, this is where the real, uh, you know, interesting, the luster of, of the paper is, is in the physics behind this. Um, we decided, and, and I do believe Denny was right, that the answer is no, it all needs to be taken out. Because we don't want to have people focusing on, on a, num a, a number, a simple algebraic proof and get distracted by the physics, okay? That's, that's beneath it. But um, if you have interest in that, which I do, so um, let's take a look at it. So actually, because this is what made the proof so easy to come to. All right, you have the the Riemann zeta function in the form of driven harmonic oscillator, all right? Then you can do all sorts of, you can know everything about it, all right? One, driven harmonic oscillators only have zeros, uh, two types of zeros. They have, if, if the driven harmonic oscillator, let's go back to the, uh, um, if, if F is a force, uh, then T is, is representative of time and M is, is representative of mass. And, and this would be the, uh, 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 omega naught, which is the fundamental frequency of the system. I mean, you got all the physics in there, all right? Now, what you can do with oscillators, um, oh, by the way, the zeros, yes. So when F equals zero, the force is zero, there's only two conditions. It is when omega, or not omega, um, uh, upsilon is equal to zero, which in, in the form of a driven harmonic oscillator would be, um, uh, the damping damping ratio 
And uh, when the Dampier ratio equals zero, that's one time you're going to get F equals zero, and the other is when the two terms negate each other, uh, or the two terms negate the third. So now we can do something really neat, and, we, and this is how it was reduced to a geometric, uh, the, the last step of the proof is a geometric, simple geometric result. All right, none of this is in the paper, but um, this is how it's done. So you can, it, harmonic oscillators are, are often graphed in phase space uh, using trigonometry as harmonic motion is identical to continuous circular motion. There are some really neat videos on YouTube if, you, if you're if you interested in this, okay? And and you can see uh, a much better description of all these areas if this is new. It's very interesting. So we can have, we can do a number of things here. My thought is we like to plot it in a complex plane, all right? Instead of velocity, we're gonna make other things. Instead of orbit, we're gonna, we're gonna have time uh, or T, not time, because we're not gonna deal with force. Just gonna call it T, are gonna be points on this, um, on, this cir on a circle, and they're gonna rotate around, and we're gonna get points uh, on the zeta function. It's really neat, okay. And so position, we're not gonna treat it as position, we're not gonna treat it as velocity, we're gonna treat it as the real line and the imaginary line, and everything else can, can uh, um, uh, fall into place, okay? We're going to begin, and I'm not going to go through all the steps because um, I, I want to save this for another video. But uh, um, we're going to use R.J. Walker, begin with R.J. Walker's geometric proof of the tangent half angle formula on the unit circle. So our way of refining this gold is by using the, the tangent half angle substitution. And I forget the, the mathematician's, oh, it's terrible because he's still alive and he may watch this someday. Uh, the mathematician's name who came up with it. This this expression I'm gonna tell you, um, uh, I'll find it. I'll put it in the link. Um, and he said that the tangent half angle substitution is the sneakiest trick in the literature, and it really is. It is very very beautiful, <laughs> sneaky um, uh, tool, and and all mathematicians should learn it right now. All right. So with this. You could say that here's the proof, um, and this was done by R.J. Walker. He was editor of a, um, a journal, and he just released this as an image. So it's a proof without words. So see, cosine of, of this angle um, right here is equal to 1 minus u squared over 1 plus u squared. Okay, so what I did, and I had these steps in the paper originally, is we're going to generalize this tangent half angle uh, formula. And, and so it's not on the unit circle, but we could do it for any S, all right? So for unit circle, meaning the radius is equal to one. Okay, good. All right, so, and then we're going to plot the Riemann zeta function onto it, all right? So, Tangent half angle formula. Now, now take a look. If you remember, we had a, a t, t squared plus one or minus squared in Riemann's final result, and I said this has some trigonometric, trigonometric um, aspects to it. Um, so here's how it, it, we got it. And also, if you remember, in the first uh, no, it was the last video, uh, I was discussing uh, how to apply a, a function f of n to the abel plana formula, all right? Here's what it is. Right, that is the zeta function, and this is the result that I got from the tangent half angle substitution applied to the Riemann zeta function. Now, we can go ahead and make a few other, that's how all the, you saw all the multiplication uh, when I was doing those uh, trigonometric and algebraic manipulations to the Riemann zeta function. Um, that's what all of that was doing, okay? So this is <laughs> it's a very, very cumbersome diagram, okay? But let's kind of, I'll just kind of show you what, what happened. Um, basically now, for any complex S argument, all right, where are we at? All right, any complex argument S, we plot its point right here. We can get the... Um, the Riemann oscillator, which is, remember, the alternating zeta function, right? You get its points kind of taking this spiral, okay? So um, 
how this works, or how you find the zeta function from this. So you remember how the alternating zeta function is simply a multiplicative factor of the Riemann zeta function, right? And um, and at infinitesimal t, um, you have the uh, um, uh, you end up getting the Riemann zeta function. But in this, because I converted in in this right here, I converted all of the real u's to n's and of course there's some change of signs and, and so on and so forth and it's inverted but you get now you can get the the sum of these integer points and they end up all summing up to um the the alternating zeta function of which you can get the Riemann zeta function out of all right so what do i mean all right so if we're going to do just the integer arguments of t okay and we have a given s so this is going to be fixed s is going to be fixed the argument of x is going to be or s is going to be fixed the only thing that is moving and changing is this alternating zeta function it's actually the minus uh, um the, the negative of it so you could be looking at um this whole image um and i'm not going to explain that because it's just too complex i wish i had a 3d view of it. i can show you all right anyway so it's the minus all right take one at, at t equals one, let's just say t switch out t for n. T equals one, t equals two, t equals three, t equals four, t equals five, and then you're gonna go all the way down to t equals infinity, you take the sum of those and you get the values for the alternating zeta function. Isn't that neat? For me, I think it is neat, but it's obviously it's a little bit of a um difficult getting your head around. Now, time, I mentioned we're gonna have time and phase space. All right, so time would be points. For every t, we're going to get a different point. It's going to go around this circle. So time is going to have some values. And that circle has radius 1 divided by the imaginary part of s. That's this geometric is related to, to it by that. And this is tricky, but it's very interesting. Um, if you know anything about spirals, there's a, um, uh, there's a, um, what is it called? generalization of all spirals they can all be determined by by a simple um power and in this case the um distance to the points which are the the point the values at the uh, alternating uh, zeta function um all have the radius of t which are these points on uh, around the circle t to the power of minus the real part of s so that governs the radius and of course then you can find the um the angle tangent to to that radius with this function actually you kind of have to subtract it by pi anyway whoa okay so you didn't know this is all related geometrically you remember the u all right so u for um rj walkers all right so all of that is the same there's a couple different things the difference is is the radius of this is now determined by the inverse of the imaginary part of s um so this well actually this was one um but this everything kind of is is let's uh, engineers say it's constrained to that um argument so the only thing that changed you have two points uh, two freedoms of uh, degrees of uh freedom you have you and the imaginary part or the one divided by the imaginary part of s too much to go through i'm going to do another video and i'll break it all down one step at a time it'll be much easier but um that is how you get the oscillator and and see that actually is a functioning oscillator good now we're going to find the zeros with it all right check for proper rotation and translation we are so close to the proof you're going to see it right here check for proper rotation and translation set uh our our um our new form of the zeta function equal to zero so this is going to be for any zero of the zeta function, trivial, non-trivial, it doesn't matter. And um, we're gonna expand it out so we can see all the S's. And we see that this is a true statement right here. Whenever um, upsilon of S equals zero, the real part of S equals one half. Now this is a similar result as Riemann had with his xi function, but I didn't break his down. I am going to break this down and show you how, how it comes about. Remember that the, the real part of the imaginary part of T only equals zero when the real part equals one half. 
All right, that's a whole Riemann hypothesis. This is one part of it. This is just going to show us uh, something. Else. How do we know that this is the case for here? Well, we're going to set the um, second term, upsilon, in, in the second term to equal to zero. Riemann zeta function is already equal. And upsilon now is zero, and you see that the second term just you know goes away. And this very manageable sum here um, equals the right-hand side of this. And we said this right-hand side equals the right-hand side of this. So in the numerator, i times 1, in the left parenthesis, i times 1 minus 2 times i times the measure of s cannot equal to 0 for any s, right? It doesn't make any sense by the rules of complex arithmetic. So it must be in the second parenthesis. Set that equal to 0, add 1 to both sides, divide by 2, and we see that the real part equals one half. So therefore, we have our our important first result that type one solution contains only critical zeros. We have effectively isolated all the critical zeros into the type one. So we were able to rotate the entire. Um, remember that a plus b plus c equals zero. We were able to rotate that to the critical line, and that is our our first result. Now, there's only one other type of zero. We are very, very close to the proof. And the other type of zero is not when b goes to zero, but when b does not equal to zero. And if you remember, we had upsilon in the second term, so upsilon cannot go equal to zero. And two terms negate the third, and this is, is has the geometric representation of a plane. You remember this from earlier. And we're going to check for rotation and translation for this, all right? So here we go. Oops, line of s cannot be equal to zero. Solve for the real part of s. Now you can apply this. Um, you can apply this uh, um, equation in Wolfram Alpha, WolframAlpha.com, and it handles it very well. Uh, derive five. Uh, we have worked with that. Um, you can apply it to to most um, calculators, and since they're free, you can go get them. All right. Um, solve for the real part of s, and you will get. A quadratic. Okay, now you see why upsilon of s cannot be zero because in the planar solution, because it is in the denominator and they'll be undefined, right? So this is for whenever upsilon of s does not equal zero. Now you remember we had the um, uh, Abel Plana continuation, all right? So let's go and get grab some trivial zeros just to see. We don't know of any non-trivial zeros off the critical line, so we can't test with that. So let's go ahead and simply just see if it's aligned for the trivial zeros. And and of course, it you know we pretty much assume it will be. We don't want to assume anything. We assume it will be because the critical zeros all lined up. All right, but let's just check with the trivial. Make sure that we're we have this all perfectly aligned. And of course, it should be a sense is equal to the zeta function. But let's just do it just for. Uh, broadening our minds with it. All right, apply the first non-trivial zero to the able planet continuation, and it reduces to minus i times 5 over 12, and apply that to the type 2 solution. Now, we do not need to assume that the imaginary part of s equals zero for both, because maybe we'll find another non-trivial zero off the critical line with this, right? So we don't want to assume that the imaginary part equals s. We just want to apply upsilon of s, that value in there, and let's do the positive uh, um, solution first, and uh, we get minus 2. Oh, well, we already knew that because we got upsilon from minus 2. What, what's the other one? The negative solution. All right, let's do it. And no, real part equals 3 fifths. Cool. Does that mean we have a, a non-trivial zero off the critical line with the uh, Real part three fifths? No, because the imaginary parts cancel out. You see, we didn't use them, and it just gave us minus two. They cancel out. So it's saying that we have a real three fifths, which there are no positive real zeros of the zeta function. Therefore, the negative solution is extraneous in this case. All right. Now everything's lined up. We have the resources to prove the Riemann hypothesis. All we need to do at this point is solve this little geometric problem. If the zeta function equals zero, and we can prove this line here, from here to the critical line, and this line from here to the critical zero cannot be equal by the rules of mathematics, cannot be equal, it's impossible, then we have proved the Riemann hypothesis. Or we can do a couple different ways. 
Or we could say, if the zeta function equals zero, and we can prove that the line from here to the real point one half, and the line from here to the real point here one half, the distance of that line, the length of it, uh, cannot be equal. It's mathematically impossible for them to be equal. We have reproven the Riemann hypothesis. Or we could do the third way, which is the way, a uh, third way, there's probably more. A third way, which um, was brought to um, the table by Denny, so one of his many contributions, and that is that we're going to, uh, it's, it has the fewer equations you have to go to to get the proof. All, each one of these three proofs is very simple at this point. Uh, this one has the fewest number of equations, so we like that. And that is where, if you look at, if these are symmetric across the um, critical line and they're within the critical strip, then the distance from here, zero to here, and zero to here must add up to one, right? Because the distance from here to here and the distance from here to here must sum to one. If we can prove that that is mathematically impossible when the zeta function equals zero, we have proven the Riemann hypothesis. Why? Because we have proven already that there are only two types of zeros. Those, uh, the, the first type only are critical zeros. They only can have real part one half by the rules of complex arithmetic. And all of the other zeros must occur when epsilon doesn't equal zero. And we solve for the quadratic equation, and we got this, right? There's only two solutions. Now, all we need to use is this equation right here to prove that geometry is impossible. And we'll do that in the next video. Thank you so much for watching this. This is long. I hope I'll see you in the next one. Probably going to be uploaded in about a week or so. Uh, like I said, you got through this one. Going through over the paper is going to be the next one. We're just going to go over the proof line by line. It's so much easier. You have all the information. If you watch all three of these videos, you have all the information to get you through the paper and understand everything. Um, and we will do that and summarize in the next one. I thank you so much. Um, I do have a Patreon account. If you do like my research and you want to support me, um, even if you, you don't support this proof, uh, if you'd like to see research coming out and more videos, um, uh, you can do that. And I really appreciate that. All right, thank you. Have a good night.